Okay, did you? All right, hi everyone. Um, really excited to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ralph Lorenz. He asked that I, uh, I keep his introduction brief uh, as he knows all too well, if given the platform, I can go on and on about how highly I think of him and his work and I'm sure after the talk you will too. Um, so Dr. Ralph Lorenz worked as an engineer for the European Space Agency on the design of the Huygens probe to Saturn's moon Titan and as a planetary scientist at the University of Arizona. And since 2006 at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, his activities have centered on Titan, Cassini Huygens and future missions to Titan. Uh, but his interests also include Mars, dust devils, sand dunes, planetary atmospheres and landscapes and aerospace systems. He is associated with NASA's InSight mission at Mars, the Perseverance rover, the Japanese Venus orbiter Akatsuki, and is the mission architect for Dragonfly, NASA's next New Frontiers mission, which he'll be presenting today. Um, so Ralph, without further ado, you want to take it from here? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, well, thanks for the uh, invitation, Shane. Um, I'd uh, love to be with you in, in person over in uh, the sunny Emirates, um, but we'll, we'll make do with the situation uh, we have. Um, I'll talk mostly about um, uh, Dragonfly, uh, which I'm sure everyone's interested to, to hear about. Um, I'll, I'll mention a few things about Titan uh, and also um, Titan's uh, deserts uh, and how we can learn from terrestrial analogs, um, such as the Arabian desert, uh, about the processes that are shaping uh, Titan today. Um, so without um, further ado, um, let me see if I can advance the slide. There we go. Uh, so I work at, at APL. Um, the Applied Physics Lab is uh, run by Johns Hopkins University in, in the USA. We're uh, just a little bit north of Washington, DC. Um, and APL uh, built uh, New Horizons, which uh, flew past uh, Pluto and, and Arakoth recently. Uh, we built Messenger, which was uh, at uh, uh, Mercury for many years. Uh, Parker Solar Probe is flying uh, very close to the sun uh, these days. Um, and our, our next um, uh, flight project is, is DART, which will um, uh, impact an asteroid uh, in a few years to establish the, the technology for uh, planetary defense. So we have a lot of uh, very exciting uh, projects going on. Um, I've had the good fortune to be involved in a number of uh, projects over the years, as, as Shane mentioned. Um, I started out actually as a, an aerospace uh, engineer um, working uh, for the European Space Agency on the Huygens project that was 30 uh, years ago. Um, and I've, uh, my trajectory has sort of come full circle and that's actually a, a pretty good uh, analogy as I'll explain in a moment. Um, and then um, after I got my PhD, I moved to the USA and got more and more involved in, in science as opposed to, to engineering. Um, in this business, one, one gets involved in a lot of uh, projects and proposals that, that never come to fruition, uh, or at least take many, many years to come to fruition. Uh, one of those uh, <clears throat> was a Titan submarine study a few years ago, which, uh, which uh, Shane participated in as, as well. Um, in the mid 90s, late 90s, while uh, Cassini was on its way to Saturn, uh, I was involved in the Mars Polo Lander, uh, which, uh, which crashed. Um, that, that happens, but uh, uh, as you saw just last week, um, we are uh, very excited to see uh, a successful landing by, by Perseverance with uh, traumatic footage. And, and uh, I must congratulate uh, everyone in the UAE for on the arrival of the, the HOPE uh, orbiter at Mars. I'm very uh, interested to uh, see how its data uh, look. Um, uh, it'd be great for studying uh, the Martian climate. So uh, Titan um, is the second largest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. It has a gravity about the same as the Earth's moon. Um, but, but what it makes it very distinctive is that it has a, a, a dense atmosphere, um, about four times denser than, than the one we are breathing right now. Um, Titan orbits Saturn. Uh, it orbits synchronously like, like Earth's moon, so it always has the same face pointing to Saturn. And Saturn and Titan go around the sun uh, once every 29 and a half years. Um, and that's uh, an important time scale because the orbit of Saturn um, more or less sets the scale on, on how long it takes to get from Earth to Saturn. It takes basically a quarter of a, a Titan year. 
So this is not an enterprise for uh, instant gratification. Um, Cassini was launched in, um, in uh, 1997 uh, and took seven years to get to, uh, to Titan. Uh, we had a four-year mission of Cassini orbiting Saturn and studying Titan once a, once a month or so. And then the Cassini mission was extended uh, by two years and then, then another seven years, in fact, out, out through uh, summer solstice. Um, one, one interesting point is that uh, Saturn's orbit around the sun is eccentric. Um, uh, it's closer uh, to the sun by about 10% um, during what is now uh, southern midsummer. Um, and that means southern summer is shorter and hotter than northern summer, and that has, has actually the interesting effect of pushing all of Titan's liquid methane, it has seas uh, of liquid methane, uh, to the northern hemisphere. And that's something that probably changes on 50,000-year um, timescales as the uh, orientation of the poles and the orbit evolve. Um, 29 years is a sort of interesting timescale on, on, uh, in human terms. Uh, in that, um, you know, we basically get to go around the block um, two and a bit times, and you can map your your big life events on on a Titan year, uh, and you can see that uh, the plan for Dragonfly, with launch in 2027, is almost uh, exactly a Titan year after Cassini, and its arrival is basically at the same uh, Titan season as Huygens. And that was actually done, done on purpose um, because it means we can use the, the Huygens data to understand what the, uh, what the weather will be like at Titan. Um, I like to um, map um, uh, some of my own life events on, on this, uh, this timescale. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to, to write about some of the, the work I do um, in engineering uh, and in science. Um, and I had my first book out just before Cassini arrived, um, predicting what we would find, and much of that is wrong. Um, but I've um, uh, updated that uh, with Titan Unveiled in 2009, and uh, actually just uh, just this year or just last year, uh, a new book with uh, all of Cassini's um, uh, major findings uh, in it. So uh, look out for that if you're interested in in Dragonfly and, and what it might explore. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just a, a, a sort of brief histor historical recap on, on Cassini, um, just because it's a fun story. Um, it took seven years uh, flying by Venus twice, Earth once, Jupiter once, uh, to get out to Saturn with the biggest rocket that, um, that the US planetary program had at the time, uh, the Titan IV. Um, it was a spectacular launch in Florida at night. Um, uh, it carried uh, the Huygens probe, which was built um, by the European Space Agency. And uh, the probe uh, coasted by itself after release from Cassini for, for three weeks with just, uh, just a battery um, <clears throat> driving a clock to wake it up just before uh, entry. Um, it screamed into the atmosphere, protected by uh, you know, a heat shield, parachute deployment. This was all uh, new stuff for ESA at the time. Um, because the Titan atmosphere is so, so thick, uh, it took two and a half hours for the probe to descend to the surface. Uh, contrast that with the, uh, the seven minutes of terror at Mars. Uh, and then there was no expectation uh, whether the uh, probe would survive or not, because we had no idea what kind of surface we would land in. There were ideas about uh, seas of methane, fluffy dust of some sort. Um, you know, it, it could have been a solid sheet of ice. Um, my, my own uh, PhD uh, work was actually designing and building a little sensor, just a little 14 gram um, uh, instrument on the, the nose of the Huygens probe that basically was just rammed into the ground at uh, five meters a second. And what it does is it records the, the force uh, on the tip um, and uh, samples that at 10,000 times a second and you get a, a force profile. And you know, when you squeeze dry sand together, the grains lock up and you get this sort of exponential uh, growth. Uh, wet clay uh, deforms more or less uniformly like a viscous fluid and you get this constant resistance. And then gravel has a spiky signature with the peaks and the spacing of the peaks uh, relating to the, the particle size. So it's a very simple measurement in principle and, and a visceral one that you can kind of understand. Uh, and uh, after 
uh, building that for three years and waiting another nine years for it to arrive. You know, it uh, it recorded uh, you know one one twentieth of a second worth of data, five hundred and twelve bytes, uh, and and of course the signal looked nothing like those tests done in the lab. Um, basically, what we think is is we landed in something that had the texture of uh, of uh, wet sand. Actually, there were other indications that the the sand here was was damp with methane and ethane. Um, there was a little spike at the beginning. Uh, we think maybe we hit one of these uh, these rocks. And there's a sort of fun story about uh, the instant interpretation in front of the media at the time. Anyway, that was a, a fun thing to do. Uh, and, and that was just the, the start of a big adventure as Cassini uh, flying by Titan revealed uh, piece by piece of, of Titan's landscape. Um, Titan seems to be shaped by many of the same processes that shape Earth, but the working materials and the rates of those processes are different. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, this is a, a mosaic um, uh, taken by the, the of pictures taken by the probe as it descended and then then reprojected into a sort of airplane window view. The, the probe landed down here in this sort of stream bed. Uh, you can see some some river networks um, in this bright highland. And there's a couple of dark streaks off in the distance. We didn't know what those were at first. Uh, but later we we um, came to understand those are, are in fact sand dunes. Uh, and in fact, the sand dunes cover uh, uh, about 15% of Titan's surface, far more than they cover uh, on, on Earth or Mars. And all these equatorial dark areas, these sort of wispy uh, areas are, are covered in, in large sand dunes. Um, the um, bulk surface material is probably uh, water ice. Um, but uh, the dark material is organic, derived from the action of uh, sunlight on um, uh, methane in Titan's atmosphere. And the methane occasionally rains down in, in probably quite, uh, quite energetic rainstorms and, and accumulates in seas, uh, which are currently um, uh, near, the, near the northern polar regions. Um, so we have a very uh, diverse terrain, and it poses the question of, well, if you could send a lander to um, uh, analyze the surface material, you know, where would you send it? We'd have big arguments about which, which place is more interesting. Um, <clears throat> we, we came to understand um, that those dark areas are, are sand dunes with uh, observations from Cassini's radar. Uh, this is a radar image about 200 kilometers across from top to bottom. And you can see these sort of bright dark um, uh, ridges um, the, the bright dark pairing is, is basically where the radar glints off the, the side of the dunes and reflects the, the energy back. Um, and uh, these uh, actually look exactly the same size and spacing and uh, shape as uh, large dunes in the Namib or Arabian deserts uh, on Earth. Um, and the, 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 the way the dunes are oriented, they sort of flow around uh, mountains and obstacles. Uh, is the so-called linear arrangement. And that actually corresponds to a particular uh, combination of winds that you get winds going in, in one direction and then sort of at, at 90 degrees uh, in another season. And that, um, that kind of piles the, the sand up uh, in an orientation that's more or less the, the vector sum of the winds. Um, that's different from when you have a, a constant wind direction where the, the dunes uh, line up orthogonal to them or form uh, barkanoid uh, shapes like uh, like uh, crescents. Uh, when you have a very diverse wind direction coming from you know all all, all sides, then then you get star dunes. So we can we can sort of map the broad um, uh, morphology and orientation of the dunes we see to to the wind patterns. But it, it actually gets a bit more complicated than that. Uh, when we look very closely at some of the Cassini data, uh, we find that some of these linear dunes actually have a somewhat crescent shape. And we think this may be because they are um, remembering, um, because they take tens of thousands of years to, to build, um, they, they may be remembering some of the last climate epoch, uh, perhaps when Titan seas were, were actually in the south. Um, and we can, we can try to understand uh, this sort of uh, second level of complexity um, of uh, dune shape by by looking at, at Earth. And the UAE actually has a very diverse uh, set of dune morphologies. If you if you drive south of, of where you are right now, uh, from Abu Dhabi down to, to Liwa, and you can see the Liwa arc from space um, in that the, 
um, date plantations uh, show up, there's a very abrupt transition uh, in the shape of the dunes. You have small, more or less transverse dunes uh, along the drive, and then suddenly uh, you get these giant uh, crescent-shaped dunes that are kind of linear, and there's a gradient in the sh in the shape of the dunes as you go to the south and to the to the east. Um, and that's probably reflective of, of different winds, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a second. Um, this is a picture I took with a little kite, uh, a little parafoil kite with a GoPro camera uh, of the, um, the interdune plane um, between some of these large dunes, and the, the plane is covered in, in some of these little small barkens, and some colleagues were using a ground-penetrating radar to study the uh, uh, inside uh, of the dune structure. Uh, and this, this area is um, uh, quite well known as a recreational area. There's a lot of uh, dune buggy races and so on down here. And uh, when I visited, uh, there were some, some guys uh, uh, doing a bit of, bit of hawking, which was, was kind of fun to see. Um, just let me check that the audio is still working fine. Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, so this is a satellite image uh, zooming in a little bit. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, somewhat southeast of Liwa. Uh, and you can see, I hope, um, that uh, there are these large crescent dunes. They're two or three kilometers apart um, with flat areas underneath. So the sand-free interdunes exposed. And as you move towards the, the east and the south, the, the dunes sort of peter out and they become more, more linear in their arrangement and they sort of fizzle into, into little star dunes. So something is, something is different from the top left to the, to the bottom right. And I think what's going on is basically that the, the dunes accumulated during the late glacial maximum where there were more or less uh, uniform chamal winds, um, I guess in the summer, uh, and then the Indian Ocean monsoon penetrates up into the Arabian um, Peninsula, and uh, you, you get the classic um, chevron arrangement that, that gives you um, linear dunes. And so the sand kind of built up, uh, probably in in more or less uniform uh, ways, like the uh, like the like what we see in the Namib today, to form these these long, more or less uniform ridges with a very um, very repeatable kind of clean pattern. Um, but now the climate has changed uh, and the Shamal winds dominate. So the, the monsoon doesn't get as far north. And so now we're in a more uh, uniform regime where the, the winds from the north are dominant. And they're sort of starting to tear apart those linear dunes and cause them to, to erode away basically and, and cause the sand to migrate south. So I, I, I mean, this is somewhat speculative, but um, uh, you know, we're starting to get to the point where we can kind of decode the, the language of the dunes into, um, into the climate history, which I think is, is really kind of fun. Um, there are bigger questions about Titan, of course, uh, and, and one of them uh, pertains to uh, the origins of life. Um, there are a set of processes that occur in, in all living things that we know of. Um, metabolism, you know, we, we take in material, uh, we uh, extract chemical energy from it to execute our, our life functions. Um, those functions include uh, information storage and replication, right? We make, make copies of our blueprints in, in, in DNA. And, and at some point in the deep past, uh, on one or more occasions, perhaps on one or more planetary bodies, maybe on Mars, um, chemistry, pure chemistry driven by whatever organics were in the atmosphere and the surface, uh, found a way to execute some of those functions. And we don't know how that evolution uh, in complexity occurs. Um, we know there's lots of organics on Titan. Uh, and so it seems an interesting place to explore to see how complicated things could get. Uh, in particular, uh, there may be environments on Titan where uh, liquid water uh, has interacted with the organics. Uh, Titan is, is too cold, it's 94 Kelvin, um, for, uh, for liquid water to persist, um, just in the same way that the Earth's surface is too warm. Uh, sorry, uh, too cold for uh, liquid rock to persist, but you know it does happen occasionally in volcanoes uh, or in places where uh, large um, asteroids have, have hit the surface and made an impact crater. Uh, impact melt uh, would uh, would take some 
tens of thousands of years to uh, to freeze solid. And when you expose uh, the sort of materials we think are, are on Titan made in the atmosphere to liquid water, uh, we find we can make uh, amino acids, the building blocks of, of proteins. We find we can make um, the bases that encode information in DNA. So many of the building blocks for living things are likely on Titan's surface, but we don't know quite how, how far they've been put together. Uh, and so we need to go there and to uh, explore the surface material uh, and measure its composition, in particular in places where we think uh, liquid water might have uh, interacted with uh, the surface organics. Uh, we think in Titan's deep interior, there is a liquid water ocean, uh, just as there is on, on Europa, for example. So um, these are the big questions, and we knew these would be the big questions after Cassini. Uh, Cassini was just not, not equipped to, uh, to, to, to do this. So the ideas uh, we, we had in the, the mid 2000s as, as the first Cassini findings were sort of established uh, were a big list of, of things to, to explore. I mean, Titan's upper atmosphere is interesting, its interior is interesting, the landscape is interesting. And, and these um, different scientific uh, directions sort of invite exploration at different scales. Uh, you want the, the big picture, a global view from orbit and to understand the upper atmosphere. Obviously, an orbiter is, is a key part of that. Um, but a, an orbiter around Titan, not around Saturn, which Cassini was. And so it, an orbiter at Titan would have a much uh, longer opportunity to, to explore the surface and much more, more data it could send back. Um, to examine the interior with a seismometer, for example, and to measure the surface material, you, you need a lander. And we actually imagined something a bit like the Mars Pathfinder lander, or actually it was a little inspired by, by Beagle, uh, would land in the sand dunes and then just roll down and, and open up some um, uh, open up its instruments. And then in, in between the two, uh, you would have a, a a hot air balloon actually would be a good way to survey uh, the regional landscape. Um, you wouldn't have much control over where it went, um, but um, the dense atmosphere lets you lets you fly this way. So that those were the ideas, but um, uh, Europa uh, exploration uh, kind of took took to the fore, uh, and uh, uh, our ideas about Titan had to wait. And and probably that was a good thing. Uh, it allowed the Cassini uh, findings to mature. Uh, and the, the technology um, that I'll talk about in a moment to uh, develop. When you think about um, uh, hot air balloons, they're, they're a great thing for um, you know, uh, wedding anniversary breakfasts and, uh, and sightseeing. And I guess you can, you can fly balloons around in, uh, uh, at Liwa. Um, but if you want to go to a specific place and access surface material, uh, a balloon is not a good platform. Uh, and if you think about the ways to, to do those functions, uh, a, a vertical takeoff vehicle and a helicopter springs to mind is, is really the best approach. And in fact, Titan um, gives you a, a double advantage for heavier than air flight because uh, not only is its atmosphere dense, which helps balloons, um, but the gravity is low. So you don't need to develop as much thrust or, or lift to fly. And, and I pointed this out in an article um, 20 years ago, in fact, uh, with a very garish uh, color. And one of the, um, the, the points I made in this article was that you would need uh, radioisotope power on Titan. It's too far from the sun um, for solar power to be effective. Uh, and you need the heat uh, from radioisotope uh, decay as well, um, because Titan's atmosphere is dense and, and, and very cold. And that those power sources don't give you a very much power, but they, they're nonstop. And so you can exploit the fact that Titan has a, a two day, um, uh, sorry, a 16 Earth day diurnal period when um, uh, you would on the surface be a, a, on the night side and unable to communicate directly with Earth for about a week. And so you might take that time and charge up a big battery and then make a short flight using the energy in that battery. And that's actually the concept that, um, that uh, Dragonfly uh, embodies. So we have um, been directed by NASA to plan for a launch in 2027 
the uh, exact arrival date is uh, still uh, under discussion, um, but would be in the mid 2030s for the, the reasons you've, you've heard. Um, like Huygens, we would enter in with, into the atmosphere with a, in a heat shield and perform a parachute descent uh, for a couple of hours to get near the surface. But then we would drop away uh, from the heat shield um, a little bit like the sky crane um, <clears throat> and, and fly and land under our own power. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, our, our nominal mission now is uh, three, and a, three and a bit years, um, and we expect to cover uh, tens to hundreds of kilometers. Um, the, the goal uh, when we started Dragonfly's development was that we could drive further, uh, we could fly further in one flight than any Mars rover has ever driven. Um, that that may, may be a little tough to meet now because the rovers keep driving, um, but um, but it was certainly a good uh, par paradigm to, to, to set. It's really, really transformative mobility. Um, yeah, I'll just skip this slide, actually. Um, uh, I should point out that we have a, a great website you can uh, visit, uh, dragonfly.jhuapl.edu, or a, you know, a Google search will find us. Um, there's some great animations, for example, of uh, this uh, entry and descent and the, the powered flight landing. Uh, and there's resources like papers and uh, um, uh, articles and graphics that you can, you can download. Um, one thing to... Um, uh, repeat is that that uh, radioisotope power is really enabling for this mission um, because our, of our need for heat uh, as well as electrical power. And actually, the uh, last uh, trip that I made before um, the pandemic um, prevented me from traveling uh, was out to the Idaho National Labs um, uh, in Idaho, um, where the uh, radioisotope uh, generator for uh, Perseverance had been fueled. Um, and I wanted to make some tests on it while it was still on Earth um, to inform some of the measurements we'd make with, uh, with, with Dragonfly. The, the radiation actually uh, changes the electrical conductivity of the air somewhat. Um, and I had them uh, take this, uh, this thermal image for me. Um, I actually appear in the khaki shirt uh, just at the edge of this image. So there's me, there's the Perseverance um, uh, RTG, which is um, now on the, the surface of Mars. Uh, so that was kind of kind of fun. Um, strictly speaking, the use of radioisotope power in space is subject to um, a U.S. government uh, approval process. Um, uh, so the, that's uh, sort of um, it's it's uh, uh, not not official that we use an MMRTG as yet, but um, in in practical terms, it, it really is the the only option. Uh, and it will put out um, somewhere between seventy and a hundred watts of uh, power uh, when it's on Titan. So um, this is the sort of operations concept I, I described uh, one Titan day uh, on the on the X axis, the elevation of the sun, you know, at dawn comes up, we have noon, uh, the sun sets. Um, this also describes how high in the sky the Earth is. So it'll get up to be about 60 degrees elevation uh, where, where we're going and the season we're going. Uh, and, and the blue curve is the amount of energy in the battery. So we start at dawn with a full battery, and uh, the two main things we spend energy on are um, uh, communications and, and, and doing science, so acquiring bits of data and then sending those bits to the ground. Um, every bit takes, takes energy, um, and we don't have relay orbiters at, at Titan, unfortunately, so we won't get a, nearly as much data as, uh, as uh, Perseverance has been sending down. Um, uh, communications are, are one uh, energy uh, demand and, and powered flight is the other. So if we fly for an hour or half an hour, it takes something like 10, 10 kilowatts to fly. Uh, we really deplete the battery. We maybe knock, knock it down by 50%. And then uh, while the Earth is still up in the sky, we'll um, uh, charge the battery up a little bit and then have a, a, an eight hour downlink, send the data back to Earth, then the next day do the same and, and slowly use up the energy until uh, basically sunset. And then we weren't able to communicate with uh, Dragonfly uh, for another eight days. So we'll have a little rest on the ground. Uh, we don't have to be on, on Mars time. And the, uh, the big battery will just slowly recharge. Uh, and then we, we start all over again. So we could fly every, every Titan day, once every, every two weeks. Uh, more likely what we'll do is we'll fly on one Titan day 
uh, and then the next day uh, just do science and communication so we won't have this big dip but we'll have more uh, communication opportunities and send more more data back um, so that's the the sort of uh, mission plan uh, the vehicle is perhaps uh, a little ugly as far as uh, aeronautics uh, purists might might see it because it has a, a very unique set of constraints and and the different um, uh, disciplines of engineering working on Dragonfly, you know, see very different aspects of the the vehicle. We have uh, uh, aeronautics colleagues who who uh, hate all this equipment that uh, causes drag and and makes the thing look less sleek, uh, and they they want to put uh, little cowlings around it to to make the contours more streamlined. Uh, we have a rather blunt nose, and that's because we have to fit inside the heat shield. Uh, we have a, a big dish. Um, to uh, send the communications directly to Earth. Uh, this, this dish folds down for, for flying. Um, we use uh, eight rotors uh, for, for powered flight. Um, basically, they're as, they're as big as we can hit, fit inside the heat shield. Uh, we have two landing skids. Uh, there's a drill on each skid, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the ca panoramic cameras on the, on the high gain so we can pan those around to, um, uh, to, to study the landscape when we're on the ground. Uh, and I'll talk uh, more about the other elements. Uh, this is the mission's principal investigator, uh, actually my, my spouse, Elizabeth Turtle, uh, and one of the rotor blades for, for scale. Uh, it's actually kind of fun that the, um, the helicopter that, um, that Perseverance will deposit on the surface of Mars shortly uh, actually has rotor blades that are the same size as dragonflies. Um, but the, the helicopter itself is like the size of this instrument here. It's just a, just a, almost a two kilogram kind of toy. Um, but uh, on Titan, the environment lets us pick the whole lander up and fly it for tens of kilometers. Uh, Titan is a, a great place to fly. Um, we can fly um, at about um, 20 miles an hour, 10 meters a second. Um, and the expectation is that after the first landing, which is more or less done in the blind, um, the, the vehicle has a, a LIDAR, uh, a laser instrument to detect uh, rocks and gullies. So it will find its own safe spot to land, much as, much as Perseverance did. Um, but the team on the ground will tell it where to go. Um, and after that first landing, what we'll likely do is look at the pictures we've taken from the air and uh, see the next place we want to explore and fly out uh, and explore it. Um, we can hover over it or, or make slow passes and use the laser instrument to see how rough it is. And then we can come back to where we know it's already safe. And then we can, uh, next Titan day, fly out over, over a third location, survey that, and if we like what we saw at the second site, site B, we can go to that. So we sort of can have a strategy of going uh, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and that way we uh, never commit ourselves to landing uh, somewhere that we are not comfortable landing. We can explore the terrain before we decide uh, to, to land at any specific location. Uh, the instruments that the Dragonfly carries, the, the big one is a mass spectrometer. Um, uh, built at Goddard Space Flight Center, very, very close to where I am right now. Um, it um, has different ways of, of cooking the uh, material we, we bring into the instrument. Um, uh, can heat it uh, directly, it can add uh, chemicals to separate uh, some uh, of the amino acids. Uh, it has a laser to um, separate uh, heavy material uh, without uh, destroying it by, by cooking. Um, so if you look at the uh, molecular weight, the, the size of molecules we can analyze. That uh, laser mode uh, lets us look at very big molecules, for example, some and uh, many of the, the, the molecular structures that are uh, particular to, to living things, for example. Um, the derivatization, the adding, adding a specific chemical, um, lets us also understand whether the amino acids that might be there uh, have the same handedness uh, you may know that um, some organic chemicals like sugars uh, and amino acids um, come in a, a mirror image copies of each other uh, and you can't can't superimpose them there's there's a, a specific handedness um, that is common to, to to living things whereas amino acids in in meteorites for example uh, are have equal amounts of the two handedness so if there are processes that uh, enrich uh, you know, one orientation with respect to the other, that might uh, tell us why why it is that our um, our, our bodies, uh, you know, have 
um, have this uh, preference for, for one handedness over the other. That's considered a, a potential uh, biomarker. The way we get um, stuff into the uh, mass spec instrument is actually rather novel. Um, we have a drill on each skid and we use um, a pneumatic system to suck the, the cuttings up from the ground uh, and into the instrument. So what, what takes on a, a Mars rover hours and hours to do with a big heavy arm, we do in a fraction of a second um, by exploiting Titan's atmosphere to just suck up the, the pieces. And we have colleagues at uh, Honeybee Robotics in California that uh, prototype this for us uh, during a, a early study phase. And they have a great uh, YouTube video. If you Google uh, Honeybee and uh, Draco or Drill Organics, something like that, you should find it. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to see how this, how this works. Um, basically, we have a, a conical drill bit uh, it's conical so that it, it won't get stuck and it won't uh, clog. Um, and that generates a little pile of, of sand size cuttings. And we um, uh, draw those into the tubing with a, with a blower, with a, a pump, an air pump, just, just like a vacuum cleaner. Uh, and uh, as the uh, uh, dirt flows through the pipes, it gets intercepted by these little uh, little sample cups that have an angled uh, deflector plate. Um, and that's what lets us kind of control the material and feed it into the instrument. Um, but you should should watch the video to, to see it in action. It's, it's really very cool. And we've tested it at literally very cool temperatures. Um, we, we've run this in liquid nitrogen, um, uh, a bath cooled with liquid nitrogen. Um, you know, we have to heat the motors to, to make the, the lubricants uh, adequately um, uh, low viscosity, but, um, but the, the metal work is all, all at uh, Titan temperatures. And that's something we have to do for, for many of uh, Dragonfly systems. Uh, one of the instruments we have actually likes uh, very low temperatures. There's an instrument called a gamma ray spectrometer, which um, uh, measures the elemental composition of the surface. So we can see whether the, uh, the ground is uh, carbon rich or nitrogen rich or icy, uh, whether if it's icy, there is salt dissolved in the ice, uh, sodium or magnesium, chlorine, sulfur. Um, very interesting in terms of understanding Titan's evolution uh, as well as its uh, astrobiological potential. Um, those gamma rays um, are detected in a silicon crystal which uh, on most space missions needs to be uh, kept very cold by a, a cryocooler, a mechanical refrigerator. But on Titan, we just hang it out in the breeze and let it cool to Titan's ambient temperature, which is just perfect for this. Um, on missions to the moon or asteroids or Mars, uh, the gamma rays are excited by uh, cosmic rays coming from space. Uh, and when they hit the, the nuclei of, of uh, sodium or whatever, then they simulate these gamma rays. Um, because Titan's atmosphere is so thick, uh, the cosmic rays don't get down to the surface, uh, or only a tenth of them do. So we have to bring our own neutrons. And there's a, uh, actually, it's a particle accelerator, um, a neutron gun that. Um, is typically used in oil exploration on Earth. Uh, they lower them down uh, uh, drill wells uh, to, to measure the hydrogen, uh, the hydrocarbon uh, concentration. So we're adapting oil industry technology for planetary exploration here, which is kind of fun. Uh, we'll have cameras, uh, panorama cameras on the, the high gain antenna uh, to see the landscape around us. We we'll have a forward camera, which will give us a front view and will be uh, very nice for aerial views when we're flying. Uh, we have a downward camera for, for mapping and to look at the, the ground immediately underneath the lander and uh, a microscopic imager that um, can zoom in and show us individual sand grains so we can understand uh, something about how the, the surface material has been uh, transported. There's a couple of uh, neat tricks uh, we can do. Um, the illumination on Titan surface is, um, is dim, um, about a thousandth of full Earth sunlight. Um, there's a factor of 100 by virtue of being 10 AU from the sun. Uh, and uh, the thick haze in Titan's atmosphere only lets about 10% of that down to the surface. But that's still a thousand times brighter than full uh, moonlight on the Earth. Um, and of course, it gets dark uh, at night. And when that, that happens, we can use our own lighting, uh, some colored LEDs, to make um, uh, true and false color images of the, the, the surface. Uh, and that can be compositionally diagnostic. Um, there's another trick, which is uh, to use ultraviolet LEDs 
Um, and uh, many organic compounds like the ones we think are on Titan have the, the property that they fluoresce. Uh, when stimulated with ultraviolet light, they glow uh, different colors in invisible light. Um, you may may see that at a, a nightclub, for example. Um, so you know we'll find out whether Titan's dunes uh, glow in the dark, which will be be kind of fun. Uh, the instrument that that I lead is is a hydrology package um, uh, and geophysical package. So it measures the weather conditions, the winds, the pressure, the temperature, and so on. Uh, we have a microphone. Uh, there's some uh, more exotic uh, measurements it makes, um, but also it will do seismic measurements. Um, we actually get a, a seismometer from uh, the Japanese uh, Aerospace Agency. Um, we've tested that at uh, for Titan's low temperatures. Um, one of the most important things it, it might do is tell us how thick Titan's ice crust is. We think there is a, an internal ocean um, beneath maybe 50 kilometers of ice, or maybe it's a maybe it's 150 kilometers of ice, and the the seismic waveforms that we measure uh, will 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 clearly discriminate those those scenarios. So there's a lot of uh, fun possibilities. So the uh, initial uh, landing site we plan to be among sand dunes, uh, probably where um, uh, these uh, dunes are, are slightly fizzling out due to sand supply. Um, uh, and what you see is obviously in, in field um, uh, analogs, these ones in, in Egypt, is the, the dune slopes themselves are a bit steep to land on, but there are shallow plinths around the dunes that will let us access sand material. Uh, and then there are interdune flats probably covered in, in gravel, which are, are going to be very safe and easy to land on. So we expect to start off here, explore the dunes, and then we'll progressively work our way um, to the, the northwest to uh, an impact crater. It's called Selk. It's about 80 kilometers across. So from the initial landing site to the, the rim of the crater is a little bit over 100 kilometers. So it'll take us a few hops, probably a couple of years to, to make that journey. But on the way, we expect to find um, different kinds of material. And in particular, there's some Cassini data that, that shows us that uh, there is uh, water ice material exposed at the surface. And if that was thrown out from the crater during the impact event, it may have had the opportunity to uh, interact uh, in liquid form uh, with the organics. And that's the, the chemistry we're, we're really interested to, to understand better. Um, so we are uh, in what's called phase B, um, working towards a 2027 launch. Uh, right now, one of the big jobs is to get all the requirements of the mission written down and uh, understand the relationship between the different specifications. Um, and also to um, to test the, the various systems that will uh, have to work in Titan's environment uh, under uh, Titan conditions. Uh, we've done low temperature testing already, uh, and we now uh, have a chamber at APL that can replicate not just the temperature, but also the higher pressure on Titan. And that's important to understand the, uh, the gas flow in the sampling instrument, for example. So we're, we're having lots of fun doing, doing that kind of testing. Um, Dragonfly is a flight vehicle. Uh, we want to understand its uh, flight performance. There's interesting uh, aerodynamic interactions between the rotor blades and uh, the, the hull. Um, and uh, to make our flight performance predictions, we want to validate um, the models we have of those uh, aerodynamic interactions with, uh, with wind tunnel tests. And uh, there's a facility at uh, NASA Langley that uh, we had to get very special permission to, to access during the, the COVID uh, era. Um, so we, you know, we have lots of challenges ahead, but lots of very interesting challenges, and uh, we have a great team, um, and we're looking forward to uh, to getting to Titan uh, in uh, about uh, 14, 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, so as I say, um, you can check out uh, more about this uh, in in my books uh, or at our Dragonfly website. So with that, I'll I'll end and um, maybe take some questions. All right, that was great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, so let me start. Uh, so this drill that you mentioned, uh, how deep can it go below the surface? So we um, have a requirement to be able to access material from um, uh, about uh, six centimeters below the skid plane. Um, we, that, that will let us take uh, th three uh, distinct levels uh, with a you know, full set of, uh, of material. Um, we, we, we um, you know, if we are on a, let's say, a, a shallow uh, sand layer, um, we'll, we'll, we'll know that perhaps from the, the morphology. Uh, and if we 
feel the need, we can pick the lander up and fly it, you know, 20 meters to the left. Um, so we don't really need to drill very deep. Uh, and in fact, there aren't many um, rotorcraft uh, that have drills. It's, a, it's an interesting contradiction that, you know, mm. the drill engineers want, want you to have a very heavy vehicle. So you can put the, what they call the weight on bit. Um, but obviously the flight engineers want, want the vehicle to be light so it's easy to fly. So there's some, some very interesting sort of design tensions there. Um, but um, yeah, just, uh, just six centimeters uh, for uh, the, 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 the drill. Cool, thanks. We have a question by Dennis. Uh, Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Ralph, for a very cool and interesting talk. Uh, I have a few small questions. Um, firstly, uh, will there be any sort of uh, cloud probe in the meteorology package, or will it just measure the uh, sort of specific community? And uh, uh, the, the second question is, um, if uh, are, are there any um, sort of automatic precautions, or are you, are you planning for the eventuality of the Dragonfly kind of getting stuck or maybe frozen in, in the soil uh, or maybe stuck in some sort of like small lake or, or puddle or are there any uh, precautions for that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Um, so we um, we have the, the panorama cameras and the, the forward cameras that will you know, image above the horizon. Uh, so if there are clouds, uh, we will have the opportunity to, to see those. Um, we have photodiode sensors um, that are mounted on, on the skids, um, notionally to be able to detect um, uh, sand motion. Um, one of the things to um, understand the dune shape uh, in terms of climate history is to know the speed uh, at which sand starts to move. Um, there are models for that. We have wind tunnel measurements of representative materials, but we don't know for sure. Um, what the, the saltation threshold is at Titan conditions. And so what we'll do is we'll spin one of the rotors up at, at set speeds to impart a wind stress on the surface and detect from the, the shadows of the sand grains as they go between the photodiode and the sun, uh, you know, when, what, what wind speed uh, causes sand to move. So the signals uh, from those photodiode sensors, you know, we'll, we'll check, you know, once every, every hour or so. Um, uh, if there's uh, changes um, on on sort of minute, you know, hour timescales, then that would be indicative of, of, of cloud uh, changes. Um, so we will have some situational awareness, uh, you know, on a regular basis of, of what the sort of uh, opacity uh, is. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of people ask about uh, getting stuck. Um, that's um, uh, that's an interesting question. If you uh, look into the, the, the helicopter literature, there's never any spe specification of, of stickiness. Uh, we, we have a, a thrust margin um, you know, built into the rotors to you know, lift more than just the weight. Uh, we have to maneuver. Um, and we do have a specification for, um, for skid adhesion. Um, the, the best I could do for that was actually from the food engineering literature, um, because that industry is, um, you know, very focused on handling uh, slurries and, and mixtures of, of adhesive materials. And uh, we, we have adopted the specification for sticky dough. Um, so, I mean, you, so there's, a, there's a, a rule I have that you can always imagine some planetary scenario that will defeat any finite cost space system. But right. you can always say, what, what if, you know, what if an asteroid hits us? I can't say it's impossible, but you have to consider every possible hazard and assess, you know, how likely is this to happen? How bad is it if it does happen? Uh, should we spend money? And it's a cost constrained project um, to, to mitigate that risk, or do we accept the risk? Um, and, you know, the, the, the harsh reality is that for space exploration, there is some level of risk you must accept. I mean, just putting the thing on a launch vehicle uh, on a rocket gives you a one or two percent chance of blowing up, you know, in Florida. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, the, if the risk is at that sort of one percent level, then you start thinking about spending money on bigger skids or more powerful motors or, or whatever. Um, but the, the rational expectation um, is that um, uh, where we're going should be dry. Um, 
uh, we're going to a dune field, we'll start in a dune field, but then we'll move to the, the, the crates. But we certainly can't eliminate the possibility of um, uh, of damp or sticky material. And, and, and you know, I've seen that down in Liwa. You know, you're among the sand dunes, but sometimes those interdunes, the, the groundwater, you know, you know, penetrates to the, the base level and, and you actually have exposed liquid. Uh, so we're not expecting it. Um, and uh, there are scenarios that, that could cause us to lose mobility, um, but we, um, we have some margin built in. And, and should we lose mobility, you know, should we break a rotor or get stuck? Um, that yeah. isn't the end of the story. Then we're just a lander that, you know, like most planetary yeah. landers in the history of planetary exploration is, is going to explore one spot. Um, so yes, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge trying to quantify uh, and assess all the different risks that uh, one can imagine in a planetary environment. It uh, looks like yeah. there was a question in the Q&A. Let me see if I can read that. Titan's world, do we know what we expect about the ability to have ammoniated water to solvate biological molecules? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, Titan has a dense atmosphere and from the isotopic ratios of argon that we measured with Cassini, uh, we think that the nitrogen uh, actually was brought to Titan as ammonia or as ammonia hydrate um, water solution of ammonia. And some of that ammonia may remain in Titan's deep interior in the, in the ocean. So does that solvent um, treat biological molecules differently? Um, I don't actually know. Um, a colleague of ours on the on the team, uh, Catherine Nish, who was my PhD student um, uh, many years ago, uh, has done a lot of experiments on um, the hydrolysis of uh, Titan materials. Um, you know, their breakdown um, under um, under the action of liquid water uh, to form amino acids and so on. And uh, she certainly has explored the different rates of those uh, hydrolysis reactions. Um, but I don't think there's been much work on the specifics of uh, the solvation of those molecules in, in ammonia solutions. And, you know, you can imagine that that protein folding or something might be quite different. Um, certainly very large concentrations of ammonia are toxic to, to most organisms we, we know of. I mean, that's why ammonia is good for cleaning. Um, uh, but uh, the answer is I don't know. There's certainly a lot of laboratory work that will be uh, important to understand what we learn at Titan from Dragonfly. Shane, go ahead. Well, uh, I, I had a question or two questions. One, um, so we had a speaker last week talking about trying to, or I guess the difficulties with exploring potentially habitable regions on Mars. And there was a sort of catch-22 where to determine it's habitable, you need to go there. But if it's habitable, you can't go there. Uh, is there any kind of contradiction like that on, on Titan? It seems like you know th there's a lot of regions that could be habitable. Um, happily not. Um, the uh, we and we work with the Planetary Protection Office uh, at NASA headquarters. We're um, uh, actually sort of in the process of you know writing the the formal um, project policies. Um, the there are special regions, what they call special regions on Mars, um, that are planetary protection category four, uh, <laughs> where you know liquid water might be present, and you can imagine that if um, there were certain organisms on the surface of a of a rover, and you went to one of those special regions where there's liquid water, then then you can inoculate that environment with terrestrial bi biota, and it might flourish. And if it flourishes, then it might uh, obliterate uh, any signatures of whatever Martian life is there already. Um, that may or may not also be applicable to Europa. Um, mm. However, for Titan, uh, Titan is considered category two star. There is no expectation of extant biota on the surface because the surface is at 94 Kelvin and nothing mm. metabolizes and, and rep replicates that we, we know of. So uh, if there is life there, it's on a very different chemistry um, and unlikely to be supplanted by anything we brought with us. Uh, we we do we ha are obliged by the Planetary Protection Office to make an evaluation of um, whether we could create any um, local environments that would be habitable. So we, we do studies to make sure that the, there's actually not enough heat from the radioisotope generator to melt its way through to the ocean. Um, it doesn't doesn't happen fast enough, in fact. Um, 
and we'll probably be obliged to do an inventory, you know, take, take swabs of all the spacecraft surfaces so that we understand what, what, what bio burden we have. Mm. Um, but there's no sterilization requirement because, um, because Titan's dead cold. Hmm. Okay. Um, I had a similar question too. So the same speaker compared, um, you know, being able to search for ancient parts of Mars much more readily than you would on earth. I think she said there was only like a few regions, like in South Africa, you can find rocks that are 3 billion years old, but obviously with earth, there's tectonic activity, but more importantly to Titan weather. Uh, and, and climate processes. So I was curious if Dragonfly has the capacity to explore, you know, any ancient terrain. Um, I know you said you, you're trying to hope, hopefully end at the crater. So maybe there's some primordial surface that you can uh, see there. So it, it is a sad reality that um, even with Dragonfly's transformative mobility, uh, we can't explore the whole planet. Hmm. Um, uh, the oldest area that we know of in terms of um, crater counts uh, is this bright area called Xanadu. Um, it, it seems to have more uh, craters visible at the you know, 100 kilometers sort of scale. Uh, there's a lot of mountains there, um, a lot of gravel. Um, that's what makes it uh, radar bright as well as infrared bright. So that's probably the oldest terrain um, but the objectives of the mission, you know, are to go to where we think we can access material where liquid water is interacted with the organics. And that, that's what led us to the Selk uh, impact crater here. Uh, there would be other reasons to explore. Uh, there's a, a possible cryovolcano uh, over here. Uh, it turns out it's actually astrodynamically easier to access uh, Titan's um, trailing hemisphere. So, so this half of Titan rather than this half. The, the entry speeds coming in from space are, are slower on this side, uh, so the heat shield isn't stressed as much. Um, so that's, that's, that's one factor for, for pointing us here. Um, and you know, someday we would want to explore the seas, I think, but that might take a, a different vehicle, perhaps a, a dragonfly with, with floats on the skids, <laughs> um, or, or maybe a boat or a submarine, as, as you've, you've worked on. So. Right. Um, we are, are going to have to rely on our uh, local um, mobility um, to explore, uh, hopefully, outcrops um, near the crater. Um, so, you know, this is a pretty diverse uh, terrain. I mean, the best Cassini images we have are only 300 meters or a kilometer in resolution. Um, and we're relying on, on analogs, on terrestrial analog geology to, to interpret it. But um, after we move away from the dunes towards the crater, you know, I expect there are going to be some gullies, um, uh, you know, river channels where, where methane rain has eroded into perhaps the, the, the bedrock here. And that may, as on Earth, give us some exposures that we mm. can access of, of deeper material. The, the crater itself, um, you know, the impact ejector will have been excavated from you know, a kilometer or two down. Um, will we recognize it when we get there? We don't know. That's what exploring is, is all about. Um, so no guarantees, but, um, but uh, I think our expectations are high for uh, being able to access very, very varied material. Great. Looks like there's another Q&A. Let me see if I can see that. Ah, particle accelerator. Has there been collaboration from other industries that went into Titan? Oh, that's from... Is that from you? Um, That's my brother. <laughs> oh, um, so we um, we haven't. Um, I, I wouldn't say we've interacted with anyone from the food industry specifically. Um, the uh, neutron generator, um, which is is kind of cool. You can you can call it um, a particle accelerator. Uh, you can call it a fusion reactor, actually, because what it does is it's a little tube that accelerates deuterium atoms into tritium atoms. And when they hit at high energy and fuse, they throw out a neutron. Um, the, those things are used for um, oil exploration uh, and um, some uh, uh, security applications. You know, if you want to look through a, uh, the back of a, um, uh, an articulated truck uh, and see whether it's full of 
explosive or something. Some of these kind of instruments are, are, are used in, in those kind of applications um, and in the, the ignition of, of nuclear weapons. Um, so it's a kind of um, ob obscure uh, industry, um, but we have uh, colleagues at Schlumberger, uh, the, the oil uh, exploration company that are working on the adapting their their neutron generator for dragonfly um there are you know some some tweaks you have to make to the electronics that you use to make it space qualified to tolerate radiation and uh, temperatures and things like that um we i mean it's it's um it's broad enough for what are usually space people for example, at, at APL to, to work with aeronautics people. We have colleagues at uh, the Penn State University that um, do a lot of the rotorcraft analysis for us. Um, the colleagues at, at Honeybee Robotics doing the drill, um, they're, they're mostly um, mechanism people. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it, <clears throat> we have a, a very broad range of disciplines we interact with. And I expect over the years, we'll, we'll probably engage consultants from uh, a number of places. Reach out to Pillsbury about that doughy uh, <laughs> sticking coefficient. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Uh, is there there a, uh, uh, maybe others can uh, ask. I can wait. No rush. I'll ask another time. Go ahead. Iskander. Oh, hi. I Hi, Ralph. Good seeing you. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't see myself. Yeah, I, I, oh, uh, hi, Iskander. Yes, I remember you from uh, from the, the submarine work. Right. That's that's what I was getting at. You sort of uh, answered that question. Um, I know you're, you were you were not happy about Dragonfly, but we were happy about the Dragonfly. We were rooting for a submarine, as you can imagine. So did you give up on those lakes? And you mentioned that someday, but I thought those lakes were fascinating, those hydrocarbon lakes. and. You're basically saying sand is more important, or I mean, I'm curious so, if you're going to go I, back to the research. That, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, actually, from a chemical standpoint, yes, the sand is more interesting. Um, as uh, as the Cassini data uh, progressively came in, um, we've had um, several measurements of the depth of Titan seas. Um, basically pointing Cassini's radar straight down, uh, we were able to get a, a bottom echo. Um, and the fact that we could see a bottom echo through 160 meters of liquid um, means the liquid is very radar transparent. And that means it's almost um, pure methane. There's not a lot of nitriles or other compounds dissolved in it. So mm -hmm. in, in, in an astrobiological sense, the, the lakes and seas are probably not that interesting. I mean, in an oceanographic sense, absolutely. And they, they, they should be explored sometime. Um, but there's a, a more practical reason for, for, um, for our change in focus. Um, and that is Titan seasons. Um, when um, back in 2009, we uh, proposed a concept called the Titan Mari Explorer. It was basically a capsule that would, would float on the seas and drift around, measure the composition of the liquid, measure the depth with a sonar. Uh, and it was uh, to be, if, if it had been selected in 2009, it would have been um, built and launched, uh, would have launched in 2016, I think, um, and would, have, uh, would arrive in 2023 in late uh, northern summer. And when it's northern summer, the seas at the north are in lots of sunshine and they can see the earth. So you can transmit the data to earth. Now, when uh, NASA invited proposals uh, back in 2016 for um, uh, a, a bigger class of mission, the, the New Frontiers class, they stipulated uh, launch would be in 2025. And if you launch in 2025, you get to Titan, you know, in southern summer. Mm -hmm. So the seas are not in view of the Earth. There's no way you could have a single mission that went to the seas and would be able to send its data back. You would need to have um, an orbiting spacecraft to serve as a relay, which is now, you know, double the cost, roughly speaking, uh, and just not affordable in the, the cost envelope that, that NASA solicited proposals for. So the, the exploring the seas was actually our starting point 
um, thinking about dragonfly. And then we kind of realized, oh, we can't do, we can't go to the seas. Uh, what else could we do? It's like, oh, well, I guess we will land on the the dunes. Um, and then it was like, oh, oh, but if we, how are we going to land on the dunes? But if we land with rotors rather than using rockets, well, then we have the hardware that we can just pick the whole lander up and and explore. So I, I fully agree with you. Um, the seas uh, deserve exploration, and we should we should get back to them. Um, but I think after Dragonfly, probably the logical next step is a, a Titan orbiter to get a better global picture um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know map the seas better, uh, understand where in the seas we would want to go, um, perhaps with a, a submarine or a or a boat. Makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker. Yeah, great thank talk, you. Ralph. Yeah, very yeah, nice. Thank you, Ralph. Questions. Very yeah. nice. well, it's a, my, my pleasure. Let's let's do this again, maybe in person sometime. In person, yeah. out in Liwa, yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. OK, Bye, thank Ralph. you all. Uh, there's thank a you. talk starting in about uh, 25 minutes by Srini. Uh, I have given the link to register. Uh, it's about... Uh, solar flares, it's threats, and things like that. So please, uh, and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Bye, Ralph. Thanks again. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.